Good morning and welcome to the local superintendent's advisory council meeting on May 26, 2020. The very first item on our agenda is regulations for a second reading new regulation of 702 KAR 1 colon 180 secure school security risk assessment tool. And this is a second meeting. We'd like to welcome Ms. Robin Kinney and Mr. Matt Ross with the uh, Kentucky Department of Education. And also on the line calling in is Mr. John Akers with the Kentucky Center for School Safety and Mr. Ben Wilcox with the uh, State uh, School Security Marshal. So welcome everyone. Good morning, this is Robin Kenny. It's a pleasure to be here with you this morning. Um, our first item on the agenda is an amendment to 702 KAR 1 colon 180. And in 2019, Senate Bill 1 amended KRS 158.4439 to require the Kentucky Center for School Safety to approve a school security risk assessment tool. KRS 158.444 requires the KBE to promulgate the regulation related to school safety, and that is why it's coming through the Kentucky Board of Ed Education. It is before you for review. If you can recall way back to February, that seems like such a long time ago, but if you can recall, we first brought this to you for a first reading in February. Since that time, the General Assembly passed Senate Bill 8 in the 2020 session, and that required some changes to be made to Senate Bill 1 and also required some changes to be made to the uh, uh, security risk assessment tool. Uh, the version that you have in front of you today, the Kentucky Center for School Safety, approved this revised tool on April 29th, 2020. And it's actually divided into three sections. Uh, the first section really deals with demographics. So questions that will be asked of the school district and schools about demographics. The second section um, looks at statutory safety requirements. And this is a revision from our first reading. We um, work together with the Center for School Safety and um, the school security safety officer, Mr. Ben Wilcox, who is with us today and really tried to encourage um, so that it would be very clear to local school districts the statutory requirements of this tool. So you'll see in section two, where throughout the section two, they have added those statutory citations to make it very clear. There is a third section, which um, is entitled current trends. Those are uh, parts, uh, questions that will be asked. However, they are not statutorily required, so they will not be incorporated into the regulation. Um, and we have with us today John Akers from the Kentucky Center for School Safety and Ben Wilcox, our school safety uh, marshal, to answer any questions uh, or clarifications. I'm glad to have this stuff behind me, but, but man, Jennifer, can you still hear me? Yes, I can hear you just fine. Okay, whoever was speaking, I, I can't hear them speaking. Robin, I think it was someone who just had had inadvertently un, or not muted. So. Oh, okay, okay. I thought someone was asking a question and I couldn't hear the rest of the conversation. Thank you, Todd. So we're, uh, the gentlemen are here along with myself to answer any questions that you may have about the revisions um, at, that are before you today. Do we have any questions or comments from the LSAC members? I was pretty vocal. This is Russ Tilford. I was pretty vocal earlier in February of, of some concerns with the document as it was printed. And I do appreciate the effort of uh, Mr. Wilcox, Mr. Akers, and others to go back and, and revisit this, and I am very much uh, in support of the document as it's presented today as a second reading, and with that, I'll move that we accept the, the recommendation. Great. Any other questions or comments? 
If not, do we have a second? Thank this you. Is I'll second. Okay, second by Danny Atkins, is that correct? Sorry, Harry. <laughs> yes. Uh, at this time, I'd like to ask Miss Mrs. Falker if she would please to complete a roll call vote. Danny Atkins. Danny Atkins. Yes. Kirk Biggerstaff. <clears throat> Kirk Biggerstaff. Yes. Tim Bobrowski. Tim Bobrowski. Yes. Harry Burchett. Harry Burchett. That's a yes. David Cox. David Cox. Yes. Jerry Green. Jerry Green, yes. Keith Hale. Keith Hale, yes. Sheila Mitchell. Sheila Mitchell, yes. David Raleigh. David Raleigh, yes. Kelly Ransdale. Kelly Ransdale, yes. And Russ Tilford. Russ Tilford, yes. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, moving on with the agenda, um, under item two, regulations for first reading amendment to 701 KAR 8 colon 020, evaluation of charter school authorizers. Uh, I was made aware just prior to the meeting that Dr. Foster will not be able to join us this morning. However, we do have Ms. Whitney Crow with us. And since this was presented to us at the uh, February meeting, uh, the Department of Education will need a, a motion and a roll call vote on this. So when uh, Ms. Crow uh, concludes her presentation, if anyone has any questions or discussion immediately following that, we'll uh, have a roll call vote. So at this time, we'd like to uh, welcome Ms. Crow. Hey, good morning. Thank you all for having me. As Chair Green said, we, we do plan to request the KBE waive a second reading of this regulation um, because this actually is the third time, uh, the third meeting in a row that you all are seeing it and that the KBE will be seeing it. What happened was after you all approved it in March, and the KBE approved it in early April. We did have some legisla legislative action um, via Senate Bill 158. Um, and, and that language in the, the Senate bill didn't quite align with what we had proposed regarding the charter school authorizer training component of the regulation. Um, so I'll just focus quickly on um, how this regulation looks different from the one you all saw in March. If you look in Section 3, subsection 4, um, on page 10 of the regulation, there are three primary changes um, that are necessitated by that Senate Bill 158 action. Um, so the first is that the regulation had previously decreased the training requirements as years of experience increased. With Senate Bill 158, everyone is going to be required um, to do six hours of charter authorizer training, regardless of years of experience. So that change has been made. We also had previously in the regulation only required the training be done within 10 days of receiving a charter school application. Senate Bill 158 just says the training has to be done prior to evaluating the charter school application. Um, so we've also made that, that slight language change as well to remove that 10 day requirement. And the final change, I think it's probably the most significant, um, uh, but, but still fairly inconsequential. Um, since 2018, we've allowed the charter authorizer training to count duplicatively as local board member training, which is required in Senate, or excuse me, KRS 160.180. Senate Bill 158 explicitly um, prohibits charter authorizer training for to count simultaneously as school board member training. So we have struck that language in the regulation as it's no longer going to be allowed um, in statute to count duplicatively. So that, that's still um, the, the majority of the changes. 
um, all to align with with legislation um, and and soon to be statute. And and as noted, we plan to ask for a waiver of the second reading since this regulation has been viewed multiple times recently, and also so that we can get the changes implemented as quickly as possible and get this through the regulatory process. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions um, that that you have about these changes or any other um, that are in the regulation. Ms. Crow, this is Tim Bobrowski. I have a question. Yes. Um, my, um, Senate Bill 158, as it came through, uh, just for clarification purposes, um, board members are still or are not required to have training until we have an application. Is that still correct? Yes, that is still correct. It, it clearly says that board members um, acting as charter authorizers cannot be required to undergo any training until they receive a charter application. Um, and as noted, there's just some slight changes on if that were to occur and if the training is necessitated, what that looks like. Okay. And the, the follow-up question of that would be the six-hour authorized or trainer would be every year for every board member. Is that correct? The six hours would be what would be required when an application was received. Okay. So gotcha. it's not, not necessarily annual okay. unless you're receiving a charter application on a recurring basis. All right. Thank you. You answered all of my questions so greatly. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other questions or comments? If not, do we have a motion to approve amendment to 701-KAR-8-020 evaluation of charter school authorizers? Kelly Ransell, motion to approve. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, do we have a motion to, uh, for a second, please? Dave Cox, second. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Ms. Faulkner, at this time, would you please uh, make a roll call vote? Danny Adkins. Danny Adkins. Yes. Kirk Biggerstaff. Kirk Biggerstaff. Yes. Tim Bobrowski. Tim Bobrowski. Yes. Harry Burchett. Harry Burchett. Yes. David Cox. David Cox, yes. Jerry Green. Jerry Green, yes. Keith Hale. Keith Hale, yes. Sheila Mitchell. Sheila Mitchell, yes. David Raleigh. David Raleigh, yes. Kelly Ransdale. Kelly Ransdale, yes. And Russ Tilford. Russ Tilford, yes. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ms. Faulkner. Next up, amendment to 702-KAR-4-090, property disposal. Ms. Robin Kinney, Donna Duncan, and Greg Dunbar. Welcome. Good morning, this is Robin Kinney again. I have with me today Donna Duncan, our Division Director of District Support Services, and Greg Dunbar, who is our branch manager in our facilities branch. And I'm gonna let Donna and Greg walk us through this amendment to KAR 702 KAR 4 090 regarding property disposal. Thank you, Robin, and welcome from sunny Versailles, Kentucky. I hope everybody's doing well. We have before you today an amended regulation uh, dealing with property disposal. I'm sure most of you at some point in your career have dealt with property disposal, so this is probably not a, a, a regulation that you're unfamiliar with. But what we uh, discern basically is that the, the regulation does cover getting approval from KDE for declaring a property surplus. And after that fact, as a matter of policy, the, the facilities branch would provide details to the, the districts on how to dispose of the property. And it was a conditional approval pending their final uh, disposition and coming back to the KDE and telling us that you, know, you had complied with requirements and therefore we would approve the final disposition. 
the language of the regulation as it currently stands did not lay out that process very clearly. It just covered the surplus part. And so what we're trying to do now is to bring the regulation in line with current practices and provide districts with assurance of, you know, what we're doing uh, fits with the regulation. When it came to our attention that the regulation didn't cover the actual approval after the disposition, we had some districts contact us concerned because they really wanted to have that piece in there. It gave them a further assurance that what they had done was correct. So that's really what we're doing here today. Our, we're asking you for your approval on is to make amendments to the regulation that formalizes the process that we currently do. And uh, with that, uh, I will uh, be quiet and let you ask questions if you have them. Do we have any questions or comments? Great, if not, thank uh, you ladies. Excuse me, uh, Dr. Green, I did have a quick question. This is Dave Cox and Corbin. Um, if, if this is approved today and, and, and it goes through the, the proper procedures and processes getting done, when do you anticipate this being in effect? Because we have some, we have a pending piece of property at this point in time. And I'm just kind of curious as to, would that delay, will that delay the sale of this particular property? I, I've been working with Mr. Dunbar already. No, sir, it will not delay. And in fact, we continue to follow this process as a matter of policy. All this is doing is formalizing it. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cox. Any other questions? Any comments? OK, so it's my understanding this is the first reading and we do not need a motion on this. Is that correct, Ms. Falker? Mr. Allen, I defer to you, but I believe that's correct. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? I was just making sure that you guys didn't need a motion on this since it was the first reading. Yes, that's correct. Okay, uh, uh, Mr. Allen, you're up next, and we want to thank uh, uh, Ms. Kenny and Ms. Uh, um, Donna Duncan and Mr. Dunbar, uh, next item on the agenda is the amendment to 702-KAR-7-065 designation of agent to manage middle and high school interscholastic athletics. And again, this is a first reading. Uh, Mr. Allen? Yes, good morning. It's a pleasure to be with you all this morning. Um, as you all know, this is an item that comes before LSAC and the State Board of Education on an annual basis uh, regarding amendments to our regulation governing interscholastic athletics, specifically the Kentucky High School Athletics Association. Um, the Kentucky High School Athletics Association is the state board's agent that's designated for management of middle and high school athletics, as you all know. And uh, part of their operations involves a board of control that annually reviews all of their governing documents and recommends changes um, to those documents to the State Board of Education. So this is part of that process. We have received the recommendations from the Kentucky High School Athletics Association, reviewed those, and now we're recommending those changes to the State Board. So they are before you for review. Uh, we have on the line, I believe, Chad Collins and Julian Tackett with the Kentucky High School Athletics Association and I will turn it over to them to discuss specifics of their amendments. Thank you, Todd. Uh, we, we've got a, a minimal amount of changes. Uh, we had very few things that were noted from a year before. Uh, you've got it before you. I realize it's quite lengthy uh, because of all the included documents that are in there and uh, listed. I, I would point you to um, on the last three pages of the attachment just for your review at, at other times is a summary of those things uh, that Mr. Collins goes through and details kind of the summary. Um, and there's two, two or three other issues, but since this is the first reading, Mr. Green, I, I'll, I'll, Dr. Green, I'll take a chance on just uh, seeing if there's questions. I would ask uh, Chad uh, Collins, our general counsel, if there's anything you should think we should highlight before we throw it open to any questions that Dr. Green and others might have. Uh, no, uh, Chairman Green and uh, LSAC committee, this, this is, our, as Commissioner Tackett indicated, our normal um, update to everything. And this is our opportunity where we take our results from our annual meeting that takes place every year in September. 
and we vote on the bylaws, bylaws. The most significant one that we did this year was in relationship to bylaws six, seven, and eight. And we tried to more objectively define what athletic advantage is by including the criteria that you can see listed in the staff note. And this is, this is an opportunity for us to try to clarify <clears throat> as well as make it clear uh, what athletic advantage uh, means and give some objective criteria so that schools can evaluate that uh, on its own. The rest are fairly um, a lot of updating and uh, just clarifying things. No major changes overall. Uh, but we think we're in good order to uh, go forward for this year. And Chad, I might add one other uh, detail. We were directed by the federal courts to create that list uh, as a part of litigation in the Western Circuit. So that uh, that's not just uh, sitting around and think tank and that we were actually told to create that list. And so if any superintendents did not know that, I thought they might need to. Thank you, Commissioner. <laughs> Dr. Green, it's at your pleasure, and Mr. Allen, uh, however you all want to do uh, questions, or if there are none, uh, we are we're always available. Okay, thank you, uh, Commissioner. Um, any questions or comments? Usually, uh, regarding athletics, uh, there's never any concerns or heated discussions regarding anything <laughs> athletic. So I assume there will be none. No questions or, or comments regarding the proposed amendment? If not, I'm almost afraid to mention this, but I, I will because you're the star of the show, Commissioner. Uh, this, this past Friday, I guess we received the Healthy at Work, and this is something totally different uh, regarding the guidance for the youth sports and athletic activities. Uh, where uh, I guess guidance from the governor's office to start opening up effective June 15th. Can you provide a uh, uh, overview of that maybe for the superintendents that may, may not have gotten all that crystal clear or anything? Well, I think, I, I think to be honest with you, uh, Jerry, it's clean. It's clear as mud. Uh, right now we were, uh, we were given a, a 11.99 hour look at that document about four o'clock, about uh, well, mid afternoon before it was going to be released. Um, it, it does, it's not much different than the CDC standards that you all receive for building cleanliness and everything else. It's, it's probably as written, not 100% workable in our environment. Our board is scheduled to have a special meeting Thursday afternoon, and I can tell you that the plans right now. Uh, are to look at what can be done the 15th and what can be done the 29th in all of our sports individually, just list them all and see if we can give our schools a little guidance. It, it is a delicate tightrope that we're walking. Um, you all know as well, or certainly probably better than, than our office, uh, the need for our students to get back with adults that they rely on for expertise for advice, for counseling, and everything else. This, uh, this period has been tremendously traumatic on a number of our, uh, a number of our kids. And so they're trying to, the board, as they've talked about it, as they've taken feedback from you all, we're trying to walk that delicate balance between getting the kids the, the reassurances, comfort, and psychological help that they need and naturally get from a lot of their coaches, balancing that against uh, any ongoing public safety concerns and and uh, we did not you know we had been previously told about the june 15th being an opportunity for youth sports and previously told that that did not apply to high school that's certainly not the way the document came out so our board will be trying to take its path inside of those documents and maybe give some clarity you know a lot of that's written if you haven't seen it yet um, it is, it's written to give people uh, advice, uh, and with the exception of dates, there's not a lot of rigidity to it, but there's probably not a lot of realism in having contests under those conditions. It does appear, and we don't know this for certain, it does appear there was an effort to time the ability to have contests with the, with the governor's previous declaration of large groups of 50 or more getting together because they both happen June 29th. So at least that's an opportunity for little leagues and or, uh, you know, small fry softball, et cetera, to maybe get together. 
where our board will be concerned and where it will be interesting to know how our schools feel is I think their their discussion prior to the governor's announcement was to try to open up opportunities for p- teams to get together for fall sports, but not necessarily open up for everyone. Well, the governor's uh, the governor included all sports in his because we had been asked to help uh, suggest things for the fall and we're prepared to do so this week. Then they announced they really included all sports in their announcement. So I think there's going to be an interesting challenge there because I think there's a there's a desire to allow some local control in some areas that haven't been very affected. And yet at the same time, we all know that it doesn't take but one large gathering to create an outbreak of this disease or this virus. So you know, it's a tightrope. I'll be honest with you, Dr. Green. It's an absolute tightrope that they're trying to walk. Um, and they're going to try to get some helpful guidance out to the schools. At least this 15th, can we address this 15th through 28th period? Can they get together? Can they put them out on the track and let them run? Can they do things? And a large part of that's going to fall into your all's lap. It may be that there's an allowance that they use the track for quote unquote general conditioning, as has been done all over the country, but you may not want your facility open. And several of our local boards have already said the facilities won't be open till the end of June based on the original recommendation of the governor. So, you know, there's uh, there's just a lot of moving parts, and that is succinctly as I can give it to you. I know our board has addressed a couple of issues. I hope you noticed in the regulation draft. Um, been a little bit of a hue and cry from a, a few parents about repeating and getting an extra year of eligibility, and the board has, has basically said in their document there, They're nixing that as a policy statement. Every single person was impacted by COVID-19, just like every single person would be impacted if you allowed repeaters to come back another year. And yet they want you all to do it without funding. So there's, you know, I I think that the board's taking a position. They're not going to do that. So they tried to address them. But certainly um, this week with guidance, I'm I'm hopeful that our board can come to consensus on what they want to do. Uh, and get quick information out to the schools so they've got time to prepare between now and the 15th. I think the biggest thing our schools may not be realizing um, is the amount of additional PPE supplies that may be necessary just to comply with the governor's uh, directive from Friday. I mean, I doubt that most schools allowed for um, enough sanitizer spray to clean baseballs in between innings and this kind of stuff at this point in time because that's not normally uh, anything till spring so we need to give our people time to do some planning and i'll just cut it off there and see if there's other specific questions i appreciate you sharing that information because uh, uh, superintendents many of us received this document or information on friday and was kind of blindsided by it because the government or the governor had just spoken to us the previous day and did not mention one word about this. Yeah, and and, I was on that, I was on that conference and it was not mentioned. You're exactly right. Right, and and the previous guidance had been nothing occurs until the end of June period uh, regarding 21st century grant. Uh, uh, participation, that it's only virtual. We're still explaining to seniors why they have to have virtual uh, graduations. And then we get a document regarding athletics to open up, uh, start opening up June 15th. And it reminded me of that Val Kimler line in the movie Tombstone. It appears their hypocrisy knows no bounds uh, <laughs> regarding sports as compared to to. Uh, other school activities. And then the other question that a lot of superintendents were having was, okay, if if the athletic events are opening up on June 15th, does this mean that the dead period is going to continue the same time period? Because otherwise it'd be open for one week, then a two week dead period. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because that's certainly been the part of it. We have had several briefings with our board without having an official meeting. We've had small groups of them together. And and that has been the constant concern is we did not think, well, for one thing, I'm not sure how the citizenry would would handle or stand for, if you might say, uh, a quick opening and then shutdown. That's on their agenda for uh, for Thursday. Um, I would if I were predicting Now, of course, I do not get to vote and I have not voted in all these years with our board. But if I were predicting, I would say there will still be a quote unquote period 
but I think it'll be modified from normal years. I think if if the governor wants to open up um, a communication and, and wants an opportunity, because because one of the one of the thoughts has been that we say from June first to fourteenth, we're eliminating the coach contact rule. Get get with your kids, talk to them. Not any athletic activity, but get with them because I I'm telling you, I'm not sure people um, that don't are not involved in athletics realize the the role that coaches play in the in sustaining the, the well-being of kids i mean i we all know administrators and teachers they, they all do but the coaches have a role too so there may be some thought of letting them get back with them then you got the 15th to the 28 28th that he's basically said can be conditioning for about anybody or sports specific in some sports well if you're going to do that to shut it down the 25th would be I'm not sure any of us, uh, well, frankly, we've got an all glass front building and rocks would go through it. I know. I'm not sure how wise that would be. So I think that there's going to need to be some modification. Now, do you go ahead and say that your baseball field is still shut down during the dead period, but your coaches can be out and involved? I don't know. I don't know where they'll land. But I think we, this is a pandemic that causes you to think differently. And maybe we just need to think differently on that one. We did that for so long because parents wanted some free time. I think right now parents are telling us they've had enough free time. They want the kids out doing something else. That's what that's the feedback we're getting. And so I think it's it's probably wise for us to listen and heed that. And those of you that have relationships uh, with your board members that feel like we ought to either be tight or be loose, I'd encourage you the next couple of days to get a hold of them. I know my recommendation will definitely be that we don't hold the line on the current on the written dead period that we make some modifications but then we kind of need to hear from our, our school people on the board as far as how much modification thank you so much uh, 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 for sharing that information uh, at this time i'd like to open it up to other superintendents i'm sure none of them have any concerns at all Any questions or comments? Dr. Green, before I step out, I would I would say that if any of you have comments that you'd rather make privately, feel free to let me know in the next couple of days. I will share everything you send with our board. Uh, at this point, we just need it. I think it's important that we get sports going again in some way, shape, form, or fashion, whatever we can do. Thank you so much, Commissioner, and thank you for the information. Uh, uh, there's there's really not an easy decision and uh, none of us envy your uh, position <laughs> that you're in regarding trying to open back up and you know from some of the uh, pictures and video footage that we saw all saw over the weekend there's probably going to be a second wave coming soon and i think that also may explain uh, and i'll just leave it at that but that may explain a little bit about why the original june 30th philosophy is changing too I think there's immense amount of pressure uh, on a lot of people. Thank, thank you so much for your input. Um, we'll move on. No questions or comments. Uh, amendments. We are recall three zero three required academic standards first reading. Marty Park, Office of Education Technology. Welcome. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Green and. Uh, and LSAC members, it's it's, uh, it's great to be here with you today. Uh, yeah, I'm, this is a this is a process. It's a two step process for us where we're editing uh, the traditional um, and legacy regulation and establishing a new regulation. So I'm going to ask Krista Hall, um, a division director uh, of our program and academic standards in our Office of Teaching and Learning with Dr. Ellis, uh, to talk take us through the the revisions of three colon three hundred three first. Thank you, Marty. Good morning. Uh, 704-KR-3303, it uh, originally incorporated by reference all of our content standards. And currently, it does have the technology standards embedded within that. And so what uh, we are doing with this um, reference is we're pulling the technology standards out into their own individual so with that, 704-KAR-3303 will only have the art standards and the science standards remaining. 
Eventually, all of the standards will be revised, uh, reviewed, and adopted into their own regulations. And then at that time, 704 KAR 3303 will be repealed. So what this does is this just strikes the technology standards out of it in preparation for it to move to its uh, individual um, regulation. Are there any questions on that? And, and Krista, that's the similar process that we've followed over the last probably two years, um, correct? And so um, as we move into establishing the new regulation, uh, this would be, um, and, I, and hopefully if somebody, Krista or uh, Jennifer or anyone else, Dr. Green, if you can uh, respond. Can you see my screen okay? Yes, yes. Marty, I can see. Okay, can see you. thank you so much. And so when we establish the new administrative, administrative regulation 8 colon, uh, 090 for uh, Kentucky Academic Standards for Technology, um, this will be a, a pull out uh, separate administrative regulation. Um, it's important to note, um, as we embarked on this, this work over a year ago, um, we did not obviously foresee the extreme value um, that these academic standards um, would provide for our students today, um, as our students are uh, hyper connected, um, as as we've we've known for the past decade, and that continues to expand. But to leverage um, technologies and and digital connectedness is what we refer to it as in new ways, uh, as exemplified and highlighted through these standards, is extremely important today, as we all can share. Um, the value. So it, the original <clears throat> academic standards for technology were originally set forth around 2008. Um, and as of today, they're obviously way out of date. Um, they needed upgraded and modernized. The important thing to think about with where technology standards as an academic content area um, have progressed is originally um, they were all about um, uh, learning how to use technology, so what buttons to click, certain applications, things like that. And and today we modernize all the way through um, using technologies to transform learning experiences. And so that's what you'll see in our academic standards for technology. Um, and and I think it's important from a timeline perspective to kind of walk through where the writing team, uh, as we pulled together, uh, originally understood that. Um, these are uh, required standards as tied to our uh, as tied to a minimum graduation requirement. Um, I do want I will always pause for a second to point out that you know that that minimum graduation requirement, as stated, demonstrated performance based competencies and technologies. Um, these are how we, these standards are how we define those competencies, um, and it's important to understand that we we don't ever see, um, and our writing team uh, felt this way as well, and I, I know superintendents on, uh, on the call today would, would agree that there's, there's rarely ever a, an assessment or a test to get at what demonstrated performance-based uh, means. And so uh, we also go took extra steps to identify some modernization of what demonstration can look like. Um, that's important uh, through the work. Um, of establishing these new um, academic standards for technology. So we kicked off in May 2019, um, and just to hit on all the way through, um, we were prepared originally to present uh, for first reading um, several board meetings ago, and obviously um, now is probably a better time uh, to present first reading with our second reading hopefully being in August. Um, and then uh, I, I wanted to just touch on uh, the writer's vision um, that I, I think is extremely important to, to think about cross-curricular connections, um, establishing a, a continuum of technology competencies for K through 12. So it's important that we think K all the way K through 12 um, and then prepare students to address critical workforce needs related. And, and that's where we get into understanding performance-based. Um, and so uh, Laura Roganos on our team, who's uh, I'm sure Several LSAC members know, um, know Laura. Uh, she's an absolute rock star, but she led the work um, with our writing team 
all the way through. And so I want to turn it over to her. She's going to just share the architecture and, and discuss the, um, the structure of um, our new academic standards as proposed for first reading. Laura, can you, you want to take over and share? Yeah, sure. So good morning, LSAT committee. So happy to be with you this morning. And I just want to sort of uh, step back for just a second on what Marty just mentioned and and say that we had a group of uh, writers come together uh, in May of last year. Um, we had 21 on the writing team and 10 on the oversight team who came together um, and, and built that vision and decided exactly how these were going to be framed. Um, they chose to follow their, or the global ISTE standards, which are the International Society for Technology and Education standards. Um, and so just, just to point out that they went from beginning to a finished product in eight months um, and had one face-to-face, -face, which is a win and a highlight that the technology standards were written leveraging technology and collaborating online. Um, and so they, they finished, it went up for public comment in October, in December, the team collaborated and in January they were finalized. And, and then what Marty mentioned is that, um, you know, we had planned on, on having these presented earlier, but in uh, times such as these, they got pushed back a little bit. And actually that was probably a hidden blessing for everyone. Uh, but what Marty has pulled up right now on the, the slide is the, the architecture, um, the structure that we, uh, that we focused on. You know, it's divided into five components. Um, it's gonna start out with that grade band and then it has the concepts. And those seven concepts that we follow, uh, that followed right along with the, the uh, ISTE standards, touch on empowered learners, digital citizenship, a knowledge constructor, an innovative designer, a computational thinker, a creative communicator, and a global collaborator. And then from there, we broke the standards into two parts. Um, the identifier, as you see on the screen, if it has a one, it talks about the skill that's going to be learned in each of those seven concepts. If there's a two as, the indicator, as that indicator, then that's going to represent a skill, uh, the application of that skill. So one is the skill learned, a two is the application of the skill. Um, and then it moves on into a learning priority and the performance indicator. The performance indicator gets really deep into um, to demonstrating to um, the teacher and to the student how they fulfill that, um, that standard. Um, and from there, um, just to be crystal clear that the writing team and the oversight team were super diligent on making sure that this was cross-curricular, aligned both horizontally, horizontally and vertically, so that it was very fluid. And so um, you will see also on an overview that we um, have and that will show up on um, the next edition of this of the actual standards document. There we go. Um, it it shows that fluidity of the standards um, from kindergarten through twelve. Um, just to highlight also that when these went out for public comment, uh, we had a ninety eight percent overall approval with just very minor suggestions. And. Uh, as Marty mentioned earlier, too, you know, with, in times that we've just come through with NTI, the teachers have really proven that they will do what is required. And um, these are, you know, as Marty mentioned, a graduation requirement. Um, we've had lots of feedback, but we've also had lots of eyes on this, even um, since that the um, public comment. And people are thrilled to have this, especially during these times, so that they can have something to point back to um, and to lead these um, to lead the teachers and the students through their demonstration. Any questions? Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Laura. I think opening up to um, to to questions um, or comments that uh, we'd love to capture and we do know that before um, our second reading, we will uh, make sure to add and, and something the team is working on now is grade band overviews, but also um, we uh, just just like normal, we found some uh, few 
edits and modifications that we'll make to the document so far. Um, just to comment, this is Tim Bobrowski. Uh, first, thank you all for putting your time and effort into such great work. Uh, just one question is, we, we know as superintendents that a lot of the standards work happens uh, at the school with the principals overseeing. Uh, can you can you talk to me a little bit about how this has been shared with the principals? So um, from a timeline perspective, uh, one of the things that we are excited about is um, the time from first reading, second reading, all the way through implementation. So our hope at, from a timeline viewpoint is that, you know, we'll have eight to 10 months for onboarding and ramp up. Um, right now, um, multiple groups um, have given feedback on the standards so far, uh, including some, uh, including groups of principals. Um, we also have uh, planning to share with the P3 group of principals. Um, they've, they've been in front of the Kentucky Society for Technology and Education. Um, we've shared them multiple, I think, three uh, different um, events statewide with our chief information officers and district technology coordinators. But probably our best work so far, Dr. Bobrowski, is with our digital learning coach network across the state. And so right now, um, and Laura leads that network for us as well. So uh, super handy <laughs> that she's also leading the standards work for us. But um, that, that's that uh, been, been a hand in hand walk and feedback, nonstop feedback um, with about 130 um, leaders across the state over the last uh, four or five months. Laura probably is, is the right way to say that. We're excited about um, something that you know we had as an idea uh, in the onset, and Dr. Bobrowski, I think this goes directly to your question, is uh, student, student performance and what that looks like leveraging these standards. And so whether it's through student technology leadership program examples, um, but giving a, a student library, so to speak, as to examples of the standards all the way through is something that Laura is working on as a kind of a companion piece. Um, so the folks can see exactly what it looks like um, for students to perform uh, the, and I love how we've identified the skills and the applications. And, yeah. and by the way, we, we kind of stole that from uh, Wisconsin. So uh, <laughs> as a partner state for us. I'd like to just kind of piggyback on, on what he just mentioned was that, um, and Dr. Bobrowski, you've got your digital learning coaches, um, both full-time and part-time in your district. So they've been very um, involved with a lot of the discussions that have led up to uh, some of this work. And that digital learning coach team that I've got the honor of, of working with and guiding through some of these processes are diligently working on uh, that companion document that's going to provide uh, not only teacher resources, but um, student examples. And that's a piece that maybe we've not seen a lot in some other work, um, but just to be able to um, give a teacher an idea of what that could look like, uh, understanding that it's not all inclusive, but it gives them an, uh, an idea of where to, a, a starting point. And um, so super excited to include that piece as well whenever these roll out um, next fall. Thank you that you all answered it great. And, and I'll agree with you, Marty. You, you, you got a good one there with Miss Laura. She does a great <laughs> job. <laughs> Amen. Any other questions or comments? If not, uh, would you guys like to go ahead and share uh, regarding the next amendment to the regulation or 704-KR-8-090? Any comments regarding that? Um, Dr. Green, is that directed at, at us? That yes. Yeah, so so that's the um, that that would be the the companion step to the revision to the um, the legacy a bundled set of standards. So no no additional comments other than um, these two pieces go hand in hand. Okay, any comments from our members or questions? If not, thank you guys so much for your hard work. Uh, next up, policy issues, approval of the 2021 preschool grant 
allotment system and funding rates. Uh, Ms. Greta Hilton, please. Morning, and thank you for um, allowing us to share a little bit of, about this with you. Um, I think Bill Buchanan is on the line, so I'm going to turn it over to him to go in depth with you about the um, preschool per child funding rates. These are for the 2020-2021 school year, and they're based upon the budget approved by the General Assembly. So, um, Bill, if you're on, I'm going to turn it over to you. Good morning. Thank you, Greta, and thank you, um, Council. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to share uh, the funding rates with you. Uh, we do so each year. Um, and uh, I will go ahead and advance to the next slide, please. First, to begin, a little bit of background on the state-funded preschool program. Um, the state-funded pre preschool program does offer comprehensive services to three- and four-year-olds, uh, with disabilities and low-income four-year-olds, uh, up to 160% of the federal poverty level. Without question, early childhood is the foundation of school success. Preschool program prepares young children for success in kindergarten, primary program, and beyond. And when they receive high access to high-quality services, they're more likely to do well in school. They're likely to have better outcomes later in life, including better health outcomes. Uh, so it is a, a critical support and a foundation, again, for school success. Um, in terms of the formula and how it's calculated, uh, the formula is used to provide funding to school districts. There's really no change to the formula. It's, it remains the same. It involves an average of the uh, December 1 and March 1 counts from the previous uh, academic year. And then um, these amounts are multiplied by a per child rate uh, across three categories. And then we have a weighted category for the severe children with severe disabilities. Now, while we use this formula to allocate funds to school districts, the department, uh, funds may be used uh, in any number of ways to support the preschool program. We've got a scenario to illustrate this. If you look at this slide, you look on the left-hand side, the first column uh, identifies uh, funding categories, at-risk, speech, uh, developmental delay, and severe. The second and third columns uh, indicate enrollment counts for December 1 and March 1. And then the fourth column provides uh, an average and then the fifth column is the preschool uh, per child rates. You see them. Those are the new rates, um, $3,625 uh, for at-risk speech and developmental delay. And again, that weighted amount, $6,889 for severe. Uh, when you multiply um, the average by the rates, you get the subtotals as well as the total. That's an amount of money that would be allocated to the district, again, using this particular example. Uh, it would be based on an average role of about 100 eligible preschool students, and uh, it would support hypothetically five preschool classrooms with 20 students enrolled in each classroom. So what would a district do in terms of taking these funds and then using, it, um, using these funds to support the preschool program? terms of budget. And you see on the left-hand column, uh, various categories associated with MUNIS codes. And on the right-hand side, uh, budget amounts based on each category for the total amount. And what I think this example illustrates is, while there, there is funding, state fund, funding uh, for preschool services, by and large, it supports salaries of staff Without question, school districts rely on other funds uh, to provide comprehensive services. So, okay, next slide. Next, we're going to take a look at enrollment trends. And we see in this first figure the state funded preschool program enrollment since 2009 to 2019. This is total enrollment of eligible children. And what it shows is since about 2014, uh, we've seen a slight increase. Uh, over time of enrollment from about 18,426 students eligible to 21,649. Again, this is based on the December 1 count. Okay. 
If we break that down in terms of eligible students, you'll notice that the green dotted line represents the at-risk enrollment and the solid blue line represents uh, the children with disabilities enrolled in state-funded preschool program. What I find interesting about th this uh, chart is that if you look back 2009, you'll see a spike. You'll see an increase in the number of at-risk children enrolled in state-funded preschool program. And this coincides with uh, the time period in which we last experienced um, um, you know, economic downturn, right? Uh, and during that recession period, which started around 2008, right, we saw a lag and an increase in the number of at-risk students being served. And given the economic impact of COVID-19, it's reasonable to expect we'll see similar uh, increase in the number of preschool children eligible for services. And now more than ever, we're going to need to work together with child care, with Head Start, with school districts, um, uh, working together innovatively to make sure that all at-risk preschool students have opportunities and access to high-quality services. Now is the time for us to find ways to support at-risk families. Um, and um, so this is, so this is again, um, our, our, what we want to work on together. I'll pause there to see if there are any questions about the rates, about preschool services. Thank you for sharing that information. Uh, do you have any concerns for the upcoming year? Most of us realize that the state revenues have cratered because of the virus. And I'm sure these guys and gals are expecting a huge uh, mid-year cut to seek. Are you expecting any dramatic cuts for preschool? That's unknown at the, at the time. I realize that there may be additional cuts on the way, but based on on what was allocated, it's actually an increase across the board, right? It goes from about 76.9 to $84.5 million total for state-funded preschool. I anticipate most districts will see a slight increase uh, in their overall allocation. Beyond that, we don't know. We do know that there are funds through the CARES Act, right? There's, there's funding for child care, there's funding for Head Start, and there's there's funding that school districts can use to support state-funded preschool services. And in our guidance, we encourage districts, as you make really tough decisions, uh, to consider the needs of state-funded preschool services moving forward. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's, that's even more concern when we're forecasted to get even more money and it, it, it's highly questionable whether we're going to get more money for anything this coming year. So we appreciate the information. Do any other members have any questions? If not, thank you uh, so much uh, for that information. If uh, no other questions, uh, just want to say uh, thank you to uh, everyone. Uh, as most of you are well aware, this will be my last LSAC meeting. And, uh, you know, uh, growing up as a kid, your parents, uh, especially your moms, always want to make sure that uh, you're in the right company or surround yourself with great people. Um, although she's not alive today, she'd certainly be proud of the people I've been surrounded with, with LSAC and the folks at KEDC, or I'm sorry, KDE. And uh, I just want to tell you, it's been an honor and a privilege working with each of you. And uh, if I can ever help any of you in the future in any capacity, please let me know, because uh, I got a feeling if she was alive today, she would well, she'd be well pleased with the company I've been keeping with this group. So, Thank you to each one of you. Dr. This, Green, I, have, I have one request. Just please don't change your phone number. <laughs> uh, it's a deal. If it's all, if it's all possible, work that out with AT&T or Verizon, whoever your carrier is, to keep that same number. It, it's the same number, and I pay the bill, so it's not subject to open records requests. So uh, feel free for anyone to give me a call at any time. But 
just want to say thank you to each of you guys and uh, entertain a motion for adjournment at this time. Superintendent Green, before you do that, um, I just wanted to, this is uh, Kevin Brown, I wanted to, on behalf of the department and the state board, thank you for your service, and uh, we have a little certificate. We know you don't have many certificates, so we thought we'd give you one, um, <laughs> a little certificate of appreciation that's on your screen. Uh, you've done a great job with LSAC. You keep us on our toes, uh, which is uh, what, exactly what LSAC is supposed to do, so I want to thank you for that. I always get a little nervous, particularly when we were in person, because uh, every meeting, Jerry would pull me aside either before or after the meeting. And I knew that something, you know, we had done stepped in something or something was brewing. So uh, you were so devoted to your district and um, wish you well. Jerry, I'd also like to congratulate you on your retirement. Uh, you've been a pleasure for me to work with and we travel together. So We've had many long conversations uh, from Frankfurt to uh, to uh, even even to Lexington for KDC. So again, I appreciate everything you've offered me personally. Uh, and uh, you know, I got a little something coming for you. So we look forward <laughs> to that. Most of you knew, at least knew of my predecessor Ed McNeil. He was in this job for 24 and a half years, and he told me uh, as he was leaving, he said, "You make one friend in this business, it should be Jerry Green." He said he will look out for you, and then that has been good counsel. So I, I certainly appreciate you, Dr. Green, and look forward to talking to you for many years to come, not, not just uh, not just in, a, in an official capacity either. Thank you. I consider each one of you friends. And I just want to jump in and say congrats, Jerry, on a well-deserved um, retirement. I hope you find some time to rest and relax. Jerry and I went through new superintendent training together and began, began the same year. So um, we've had a bond through our superintendency and I'm gonna so miss you, <laughs> Jerry, being in a superintendent seat and someone I can call and commiserate with. I just don't know how you can retire at 42. That's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> That's always amazing me. Jerry, this is Tim Bobrowski. Uh, I just want to compliment you on your beard. I, I think that looks so distinguished and I really like it on you and I think that's the first time I've ever seen you with a beard in my nine years but uh, all, all uh, jokes aside uh, thank you for your counsel over the years and and you've been absolutely nothing but a, a true friend and a, uh, a wonderful resource to reach out to uh, from other superintendents so thank you for all that. Well, I appreciate that. And uh, Tim, after 18 years, this is what this job will do to you. You end up looking like Papa Smurf. So uh, uh, the time's not nearly as good uh, to me as it is folks like uh, Dr. Ransdale there, who it doesn't seem to affect. So uh, I, didn't have, I wasn't blessed with great genes, obviously, <laughs> there. But I, I'm just going to miss you guys and look forward to seeing you. I consider all of you friends for life. And if I can ever help either of you, uh, uh, I will, and uh, uh, just look forward to seeing you guys in the future. Uh, at this time, do we have a motion to adjourn, please? Motion to adjourn. Thank you, Dave. Uh, second? Second, Kelly Ransdale. Second, Dr. Ransdale. Ms. Faulkner, would you please do a roll call vote? Gladly. Danny Atkins. Danny Atkins. Yes. Kirk Biggerstaff. Kirk Biggerstaff. Yes. Tim Bobrowski. Tim Bobrowski. Yes. Harry Burchett. Harry Burchett. Yes. David Cox. David Cox. Yes. Jerry Green. Jerry Green. Yes. Keith Hale. Keith Hale, yes. Sheila Mitchell. Sheila Mitchell, yes. David Raleigh. David Raleigh, yes. Kelly Ransdale. Kelly Ransdale, yes. And Russ Tilford. Russ Tilford, yes. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Chair, for your service. Thank you so much. Hope every one of you have a great day. Uh, look forward to being back on here at... Uh, 
2 p.m. and listening to uh, for all the answers from Dr. Brown. So uh, we'll be praying for you, Dr. Brown. <laughs> Jerry, this is David Raleigh here. Uh, congratulations and best of wishes on your uh, retirement. And thanks for your service to your kiddos there in Pike County. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye.